All right. So welcome. Um, we will talk today about HTTP, about REST services, and about JSON. Um, and I have, I, I will do some some coding uh, during the class, but I also have put some examples already in. So as you remember, there is a hello jokes, which is using a simple API service to fetch a JSON object. There is a chat, which is continuation of the discussion that we had yesterday about channels and about asynchronous programming. Um, how many of you, so let me just bring the participants. Can you raise a hand if you've done any socket programming or if you are familiar with socket programming, kind of client server sockets? And Zoom, please uh, raise your hand in Zoom if, you, if you've done that. So we have one. You should have done it in operating systems. You didn't have uh, sockets uh, or C sockets in uh, operating system course? No? That's not good. All right, so not many people had uh, sockets. So then I, I may need to record a little bit more explanation about sockets uh, for the chat server because then it will be a little bit more cumbersome for you to, to use it. It's a very simple client server setup such that you can open multiple terminals and you can chat between the, the terminals and it demonstrates how to use channels and how to use asynchronous you know, concurrent programming and also how to open sockets and how to read and write to sockets. But it might be a bit too overwhelming if you've never done that before. So I may explain it perhaps uh, tomorrow in the tomorrow session a little bit more. And then there are two which are for today. The first one is a very simple uh, setup for testing Heroku. So in the follow-up uh, lectures, you, uh, Christopher will introduce you to Heroku. And then this is like a, just a, a take, take me to Heroku sort of setup, such that you don't need to do any coding. You can just uh, copy this folder into your, your workspace and then deploy it on Heroku and, and check if it works. We will, we, we will use it a little bit this, this class uh, for uh, testing the path in the URL. And then this one is a little bit, uh, so, so this one is the, the, the basic one, the, the small one for testing Heroku uh, deployment, the, the REST hello. The REST student is a little bit more elaborate. It's a, <clears throat> it's a setup where we have an in-memory database of some sort, in this case students, and then using a REST service, you can check who, who you have in your database uh, it's not really, we, we don't have a backend. It's all stored on the server side in memory. Uh, and then you can have uh, additions and viewing of the, of the items. So we will discuss that today. But the code is already there and you can use it as, a, as an example. Uh, it, both are using the pure Go HTTP package. Uh, I have not been using any additional uh, dependencies. It's, it's good to understand how things work on the standard library, library level. Uh, some things are not as nice, but it's, it's good to understand how, how it works. So we will, today we will kind of work with that. But for your projects and for your assignments, what you will notice that dealing with the routes for the, for the HTTP requests, it's a little bit cumbersome. So uh, I, placed um, an article, like a, a blog post, uh, which describes different ways of doing it. And it's very good uh, summary of, of various ways of how you can do that. And then there is a pointer to a small library that you can use to facilitate a more robust dealing with your routes. So th those two are kind of a good extensions to check after the lecture. Um, and then there is a little bit more elaborate uh, document from Go documentation on how to use closures and carrying for web applications. So those three are sort of additional resources for us for the for today's class. All right, so let's start with some quizzes. So this is the Mentimeter setup, and I will 
have the questions open for the session. So if you have any questions, you can either ask them in the um, in Zoom or you can ask them here. Th those questions here, by the way, the, the questions in Zoom kind of disappear after the class. The questions here, I think they uh, retain themselves in the slides. So, uh, and, and I'm putting the slides kind of on the, um, on the wiki. They are not mm. really public, just, yeah. but they are visible here. So if you go to the, to the slides, you know, the questions that you ask in the Mentimeter, they might be visible here. So don't, you know, don't ask stupid Yo. questions here. If you have a stupid question, ask wow. the, uh, that in Zoom. Um, um, all right, so the question about assignment one in cloud, I don't know that Christopher will deal with that next week. So you, you can check that with Christopher next week. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, so there are exercises already. So the question is about exercises. Uh, let me move to that question. Yeah, so do you get exercises? And I've already posted uh, programming exercises for Golang here. Uh, so we have a very simple ones. Uh, we have some more elaborate ones here and we have some to do with HTTP parsing and HTTP requests uh, in here. I will go to the last one because, uh, so, so the basic is very basic. We're effectively gonna cover it today. Um, and then the, um, this one is, quite nice. This one is quite simple. You can you can try that out. Uh, and we will talk a little bit about this today as well, uh, because there are two ways of parsing JSON. I will I will cover it, uh, you know, when we get there. Uh, and this one, this one is actually quite hard. So we have been discussing with Christopher about some of the REST APIs that we've used in the past. And some of them, including the GitHub ones, they are okay for doing simple things, but for doing more elaborate things, the actual API is not that nice to, to use. And students, um, and we as well, we spent a lot of time just reading the GitHub API documentation and organizing how we should do stuff instead of doing stuff. So, you know, the ratio of your coding versus your reading is you know, 10% of coding, 90% of reading and understanding the API, and that ratio is not that great. So you may skip that one. If you if you want, you can, of course you can do it, but this, as I'm saying, this one will teach you more about GitHub API than about REST and about dealing with, um, with, with Golang, because you will spend more time dissecting and extracting what you need to do from the API point of view. So that's just a warning that, you know, um, we did have this one as a assignment in the past, but Christopher is thinking of a sim simpler or more coding assignment, which requires you less fiddling with API. Having said that, when you're dealing with REST and when we, you're dealing with cloud and web services, that's unavoidable. I mean, you do need to read the documentation and you need to understand what is exposed to you. And um, this, you know, you, you can't really have it as nice as with the standard libraries or with the library documentation, you have to fiddle with this. And the bad thing is that most, okay, I, I don't know if it's most, but a lot of REST APIs are not designed to be programmers friendly for some reason. They are designed often to be human friendly, but not programmers friendly. So, which is a little bit the case with the GitHub API. It's kind of okay if you have to click through and browse things kind of by hand, but if you need to do things programmatically, you like you're asking, why are you doing it this way? Um, so yeah, just a kind of a, a warning. Okay, so another question. So how does one normally do the file structure for REST API in Golang? Um, it, there is no answer to that. Uh, th there is no standard answer to that. So you need to experiment and you need to explore what works for you. And also it depends a little bit on how you structure your router and whether you're using additional libraries or not. Uh, so it is, uh, for, for the sake of this course, this doesn't matter that much because the problems you're dealing with are small enough that any structure sort of works. 
uh, you can keep things in a, you know, almost in a single file. Uh, but if you want to be more elaborate, you can split it. And then with the routes, uh, we, in this course, we don't deal with complex problems such that you do need to split it like per, per route. Uh, I have another project with, which I'm doing with a PhD student. And in that one, we did split it into actual uh, separate packages. Uh, not, not even into individual files, but we even have packages which deal with different sub routes and different sub functionalities of the, of the web service. Uh, but it is kind of a complex, complex setup. So what I would suggest is you start simple, just start with a single file. If it gets too big and you see that it becoming, becomes unmanageable, then you refactor it. You kind of split it into some two or three logical parts and then you, you, you move on like this. So it's better to start just easy and simple, and then refactor it to a more complex solution as you need it. Because com coming up with a design up front, well, you know, your requirements change, your, your style change, and it, you, you, you don't know. So it's, it's better not to over-engineer it uh, up front. Just, just start simple, just keep everything in a single file. I often start with uh, things being in a single function, and then I refactor it to multiple functions and then refactor it to multiple files. So just start simple. All right. Um, when the question will keep coming, I will try to answer. Uh, let's do. Let's do a short quiz about what do you know. No points for that one. Just gathering intelligence. I hope you can. Um, I always have problems with that. I hope you can click multiple things. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, That's what we tend to get uh, from past experiences as well. There is not many people who know remote procedure calls and common gateway interfaces. Those were, those uh, still are technologies that we use kind of behind the scenes for some of the network connectivity, uh, but they are somewhat not familiar to, um, to people. Uh, Apache is more popular than Nginx. Uh, SOAP is a bit of a niche, yeah, but we don't use it, so you don't need to know know it. Although it is used in cloud services sometimes, so some web services use it. Um, and then it's good that you know HTTP. So I'm gonna test you a little bit on on your knowledge. Um, if you look at this diagram, you will notice that there are uh, some distinct parts. So TCP IP and HTTP are examples of protocols, network protocols that we use, right? So we have uh, layer three and layer four, uh, TCP IP and layer seven uh, application layer. Uh, so you do need to remember that. And Christopher will have lectures on the different layers and how the protocols re relate to each other and how they, how they work and why we use them. So this is not the, the purpose of this lecture, but we will kind of re have a refresher on the OSI layers. Those two are an exa examples of servers which serve application protocol layer, which is HTTP and HTTPS, right? So Apache is quite well known. And then you have um, another one, which is called Nginx. And Nginx is a more performant, more robust version of, of this one. So if you're actually doing some deployments and production setups most people use nginx it's a i'm not i'm not sure if it's more secure but it is more robust the performance wise it it kills apache uh, but both are, are good and both are popular then those two are examples of encoding and file format and a way you interact with a web service so xml is a text representation of a structured document and then SOAP is a way of interacting with a service using um, kind of a structured representation of and description of that of that service. And then these two are a way to, I mean, this one is to invoke 
functionality on the remote site. So remote procedure call, we have it on the kind of a operating system like a Unix uh, operating system level. You can have it on the uh, language level. For example, there is a protocol called CORBA for uh, object-oriented languages to do remote procedure calls such that in one application that you have on your machine in C++, for example, you can call another method on another object which resides on another machine. Uh, and it is using RPC to, to achieve that. Um, we tend to use it kind of for low level uh, efficient services. Um, and we tend to use those higher level like HTTP REST for things that don't require high performance. Although, yeah, the, the, you know, the boundaries are getting blurred. And then this one is a protocol for uh, responding to HTTP requests. So you can have a, a simple echo server like we had, for example, in the chat folder, and you can deploy it on port 80 and it will kind of work uh, the way, um, I mean, you, you cannot deploy it on port 80, but you can deploy it in such a way that it can be used for processing the request such that Nginx or Apache will kind of direct the request to that process. They will feed some text into it, get text out and push the response back, right? So it's kind of a, a mechanism for actually doing some work that is very lightweight. You can do it in C++ or you can do it in, in Golang or in any language and then have the, uh, the functionality kind of achieved uh, very easily. Like you can even have it in Bash. Uh, we don't often use it because this functionality gets integrated inside our application frameworks such that for example, in Go, you can launch the internal, uh, internally built in web server and serve the, serve the logic already from the same environment. But uh, this is kind of a cool, neat thing for playing with. Uh, so I, yeah, I encourage you to check that out as well. All right, so kind of a side question. So how many of you contributed or um, I, I, I kind of don't have a, a question that you are planning, but I just want to get some idea. Yeah, looks, it looks not too good, but I hope it will change. So I, I, I as I said, I, I don't have uh, that you're planning and I, I hope you will uh, be encouraged and you plan to contribute to open source. Uh, Golang is quite a good language to do that. There is a lot of uh, interesting open source projects that use Golang. And contributing and participating in open source is a great way to learn about community and also about programming. So you will, learn, you will find very smart people contributing to open source and you will find a very clever solutions to, to problems. And you can feel, you know, fun, like uh, doing something that has some use or is meaningful to other people. So I do encourage you to, to try it out. Go out on GitHub and, and check some projects that you're using, for example, and see what you can improve and then make a pull request. It's, it's super, super easy. And it's usually quite a rewarding experience. So I encourage you to do that. All right, so let's do some tests. Uh, how are you doing with this HDP knowledge? Like most of you said, you know HDP. So let's see if that's true. So how many we have in the class? We have 50 students. So let's wait a little bit more. All right, we can start the quiz. I think it's 15 seconds. So what is HTTP success associated with? That's relatively trivial. Yeah, it's 200. What's 100 for? 
in the Zoom, Zoom chat. Yeah, in, internal information. So success is communicated through 200s and 100 is some internal information about the, the request or working. All right, let's do next. So question two, what is not an HTTP method? So I use the word verb because we often use it in the in REST, but uh, treat it as a method. What is not an HTTP method? So of course, all you know, get and get and put. You might know delete, but I can see that you didn't know about trace options, connect, patch, and head, because most of you thought that is not an HTTP method, but it is. Um, so Christopher will go over that in more detail later. Um, trace is for checking whether the requests are going through properly. So uh, it's just to reply with the same request. Uh, options is to check what is available, what like, for example, MIME extensions the server can respond with. Uh, connect is to establish uh, tunnels, for example, HTTPS tunnels and, and things like that. Head is the same as get, but instead of the body, you're gonna get just the headers back such that you can prepare. So you can make a like, pre-get request to see what do you need to prepare uh, like in rendering wise or whatever to, to deal with the data and then you can make the real get request. So for example, if you do, if you want to get some um, uh, some large-ish data and you don't know what you're gonna get it at as a JSON or as a CSV file, you can do head. And then if the server says, oh, I'm gonna send you a CSV file, then you may say, okay, forget it. I, I was just hoping for JSON. So I'm, I'm not gonna deal with CSV, right? Um, and then patch is the same as put, but it's just for small modifications of the of the entity. So all of those are HTTP methods apart from find. I just made it up. All right. So next one, simple. That should be also simple. Client errors. The famous client errors. Everyone knows that, but then when you do assignments and when you do tasks, you use the wrong one for the client side errors. Uh, so this is kind of a reinforcement. Great, exactly, it's 400, you know. 404 is not a server problem, it's your problem. You're asking for something that doesn't exist, right? So 404, just make, make a mental model is not, you know, server side things. Like the, the fact that you cannot find something doesn't mean your server is doing something wrong. It means it doesn't exist. So it's client's fault. Uh, 500s, uh, uh, do I have it as a, okay, I do have it. So let's, <laughs> let's move on. I don't spoil the, the fun. All right. So we did have we did have 100, we had 200s, we had 400s. So it's 300 and 500 left. So what is the internal server errors? And what's the other one for? Yes. So for stuff that goes bad on the server. So like not being able to find something that's not a server problem, uh, but a database crash <laughs> is a server problem, right? So if you know your database says, whoa, the file has just gone wrong or something, then that's a 500. Like you, you are dealing with something internal to the server. Uh, but if you, if the server operates correctly, but the response cannot be um, found or communicated then you know you should not respond with 500s. You should restrict 500s only if there is something wrong on the server and the programmer who did the server needs to fix something, 
right? So not being able to find is not something you need to fix. Uh, so that's not 500. Okay, 300 redirects. So that's the left category for redirections. So how did you do? All right, that is quite a nice consistent top top 10, I guess, and blob leading the pack. Again, if you're not here, yeah, maybe check it out. Uh, check what what you got wrong. All right, uh, a mental map for me. So about JSON, what is JSON? All right, so some of you, some of you know, most of you don't. So those people who know, the next question is for you. And those people who are not sure, you can try. So let's let's do that one. So usually I use the 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 setup. Uh, how would you explain it to your mom? But I know some of your moms might be very technical. You know, you may have some you know really good mom programmers. <laughs> so that's not a good thing. So you need to pick your grandparents or someone who doesn't know much about technology, and then try to explain what JSON is. Uh, Yeah, people can Google it. The problem is if you have to Google everything, then you would be very unproductive achieving anything. So you do need to know certain things in your head. Of course, you can always Google things, but to make your work productive, you, you do need to sort of memorize some things. S same with programming. Of course, you're not gonna memorize entire standard library notations and orders of parameters and things. That's what the API docs are for but the you know you do need to memorize where to find things quickly and what things you have available to you so for example um a funny story uh, in one of the lectures last week um so let's go to my famous main go where i type stuff um so last week is um in in one of the examples I did something like we, we were doing list comprehensions and we had to, to find all the powers of two for uh, from one to from zero to ten. And I said powers of two and then I was from one to ten. And funny enough, that's not in Go. In Golang, you don't have that. You do have it in other programming languages like in Haskell, but in Golang that doesn't exist. Right, if you don't remember that, yeah, you're gonna get kind of frustrated. And that was kind of a frustrating moment when I tried to uh, to build my code and, and run it. It's like, really? Golang doesn't have, you know, a power operator? You have to use the math library to do that? Like, how frustrating is that? Um, right, so what is JSON? It is um, key value pairs similar to a spreadsheet. That's a very good one. Um, it is a type of file format for storing structured data. That's a good answer as well. Uh, it is a way to organize data. Yeah, it, it would be good to say structured data in a plain text format. You know, a sequence of numbers is also a data and it is fine. It is sort of possible to do that in a text format, but it would not be really a JSON. Um, Yes, it has to do with ja JavaScript, like that's what this JS kind of comes from. Uh, so it's good to mention that. It is again a format for transporting data. Sure. Yeah, it is the, the acronym is JavaScript object notation. So it is a native format for JavaScript to represent a literal, which is a, a Java object, right? So that's quite cool. Uh, those people who are doing PROC 206, they, we were kind of uh, talking about literals and about languages 
in which you have a rich ability to express things as literals. And JavaScript is kind of one of the best because you can express your entire object as a literal uh, using a, a JSON, right? So it's like, whoa, you can't really do that in C++, for example. Uh, so that's, that's really cool. And then, yes, it is a key, key value per system with nesting, right? So that's great uh, it, if you kind of think about it in that you, you can kind of express uh, nesting in it as well. So those of you who know, um, those of you who know JavaScript, then this is no news to you, but in, in JavaScript, you can create an object uh, we using the, the JSON notation, and then you have attributes. So you can say, I have name, uh, and you know I, you, you can instantiate what that name value is. Uh, and then you can specify H. Uh, yeah, so let's do that. This, that it's Bob and this is 10. Uh, and then you can even specify methods. So you can specify what methods that object O will have. Uh, and that th this notation with those curly braces becomes a literal. Uh, if you have a list of those curly braces objects, then you can put them into an array. Uh, and then you will have an array of, of objects, uh, which are comma separated. So the next one will be after the comma. Um, this is in JavaScript. In JSON, it's almost exactly the same. The, the, the small difference is that the keys have to be quoted. So they become strings. So you have a couple of data types. Um, so you have bools, like uh, you know, true and false. You have numbers. Uh, and the JSON doesn't really distinguish distinguishes between uh, types of numbers. It's uh, if it's a number, it's a number. Um, and then you have strings, and you have arrays. So that's what I said here. So you could have an array of numbers, right? So as as we were discussing, a long list of numbers. You could have just a list of numbers, and that would be a valid JSON, uh, because an array needs to contain some um, Entity and entities are those four. And then you have objects. And objects are those curly braces and closed things like the one which I just set here. So they have properties and values, properties and values. And you have nesting. So you can have another, um, you can have another attribute which itself is an array or in itself is an object of some sort. Um, so such that you can nest it arbitrary, um, arbitrary deep. With XML, it's very similar. XML, you can express basically the same things with the um, with the same types type uh, type system, and then you also have a kind of a binary blobs. So in XML, you can you can say, I don't know what's in here but it will be some sort of a binary data here and um you know so it is kind of if you want to express it in in json you basically will use an array which is a, a byte array of some sort and that that works the same but in in xml you have a special type for that the other cool thing about xml is that you can make references so you can say i have a, i have some objects hierarchy and this thing here is pointing over there. So you can have cycles and you can have references. In JSON, you can't really have that. So JSON, if you need references, you have to manage it yourself. You have to somehow <clears throat> you know, manage your reference subsystem in such a way that you will be using attributes such as ID or some primary key to point to something else. But as a native format, it doesn't have a concept of reference built in, such that it only allows you nesting and allows you composition, but doesn't allow you to do kind of uh, references, right? So if you want to nest something by pointing to something that has been defined earlier, uh, JSON doesn't do that for you. You have to do it using JSON for yourself somehow. And there are different ways to, to kind of achieve it such that you don't 
uh, repeat a certain record multiple times. Although, you know, if, if you work with uh, REST and APIs, you will notice that they often do that. They kind of uh, replicate uh, data over uh, multiple locations. So this, I don't know if you already had it in the database course, but it's called normalization. Normalization um, basically helps you if you need to make a modification. So for example, I need to modify Bob's age. I will, if I have a normalized database schema, I will only will need to do it in one place. If you using like, for example, I have Bob here, but I have um, another, <coughs> let's say I have Alice. So I have another object here and I have Alice and then Alice has uh, a family and Bob is her brother, then, you know, without references, I would have to put the whole thing, like the whole Bob thing into Alice family. And then if Bob is one year older, I will have to change it here and in Alice family, like in two places, right? So I, I hope you get, you, you get the idea. Um, so, oh, but then again, I, I may, I, for read, it makes it more efficient because I can kind of keep Bob's stuff in one server and Alice stuff in another. And then if uh, somebody is asking about Alice and Alice family, it has nothing to do with this one. So I can kind of demultiplex the requests and make it more efficient. That's why no SQL databases are quite read efficient, uh, but they are not necessarily uh, good in transactions, like things that need to change multiple things in multiple places. All right, so no questions here. No questions here. All right, so let's move on. Uh, any questions about REST? Uh, any questions about JSON? So JSON is a file format. Uh, it looks kind of like this, usually with uh, uh, braces. Usually you have like a top level object, which has some children objects. Sometimes we're using arrays, right? Um, and then we have to somehow deal with it. We have to deal with parsing and processing and organizing it. Um, yes. So we come back to that. Before we do more fun, next question. You know REST. So no, you, whether you know it or not, you're using REST every day. So a lot of stuff that you do online requires certain REST requests, which either happen behind your scenes or you're doing it you know, yourself, but you may not be aware of, of what is happening, right? So while you answering that, let me just go to Wikipedia quickly. So, all right. So the, the basic idea is that we had, we had those verbs, we had those uh, methods for HTTP and they were uh, to do with getting a resource, with putting the resource in, deleting the resource. Uh, okay, so Christopher says he's gonna cover it more in the next session. So I will uh, stop here. I will point you to the to the web page, and I will just say that we um, using the the rest for manipulating the resources on the web, right? So I will not ask you to explain it. Okay, so we can move on. I will not ask you to explain it to an elderly person. And let's have, let's have a break. So it's, yes, exactly. <laughs> so let's have a break. And let's meet in uh, 11, 11, 10. Six minutes is enough. I get, I, I gather it's enough to get coffee or something. Okay, so I will start the timer. So let's do a Google timer. All right.
resume recording. Yeah, chocolate safe transfer. That will be the, the next HTTP protocol. All right. So I have um, another two minutes break. So a, a quick quiz about Chuck Norris. All right, I can see some of you don't know who Chuck Norris is. Yeah, I got into trouble, like I, I said in uh, some uh, previous uh, Kahoot, um, we had a question, what are the bad words used in a Linux kernel? And one of the potential answers was shit. And I got banned with Kahoot because they said you cannot use those offensive words. So um, um, yeah, the, the most frequent, frequently used bad word in Linux kernel is crap. All right. So I can see there is not a strong hate relationship, but some of you don't know. So I have, um, I wanted to play with videos, how, how the videos work with Mentimeter. So I have a, a, a video. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Yeah, no, I don't click on that. I click here. So that's the guy. That's paragliding. So I like the last one. All right. So now you're familiar with Chuck Norris and um, paragliding, which is good. I hope you, I will you know, install a lot to paragliding in use. All right, so simple get fetch. Um, Let's go to the code. So I will have to quickly remind myself what was the URL that we've used for hello jokes, hello jokes. Yeah, let's use code. So the URL that we've used uh, for the Chuck Norris jokes was that's the ah yes that's the because here we didn't actually use the url we use the service we've designed the service and then we've used the service so let me go to the service quickly and in utilities, no, it was in types. In types, we will have the constant, which is the URL. All right, so this is our URL. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a get request. So how can we do a get request on a URL uh, over HTTP protocol? Well, we can use a browser for it. So I can open a browser, put the URL here and get the, the data back. So what else can I do? Uh, browser is great for some things, but first of all, this is a little bit messy to read. And also I cannot do other verbs. I cannot do other methods uh, easily. I cannot do post and I cannot do um, delete and stuff like that. So there is an application called Postman and Postman is, it used to be just a browser extension, but they made it more fancy these days. Um, 
Yeah, side question from Suzanne, what is 300? 300 is for redirects. So we're using the uh, error code. It, it's not really an error code. It's, uh, yeah, it is an error code, but it's not an error. It just says that the resource that you're trying to get has been moved to a different location. And we have a, a number of different 300 codes to depict what, what happens. Was the move temporal? Was the move permanent? Should you update your cache to always point to the new location? Things like that. So that's what 300 I used for. Um, good question. All right. So uh, yes, they, they've made it a little bit more uh, elaborate. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Yeah. OK, so if you use Postman, you can generate HTTP requests and uh, test uh, the, your own endpoints or somebody else's endpoints. So what we can do is we can, um, that's the wrong button. I want it here. So I want to create a new request and the request is uh, Chuck. And then I don't need a um, I don't, yeah, you need. Why doesn't see, no, I'm, uh, cancel that. So new request. Chuck. Uh, whatever. I already have a collection uni. So apparently they have something broken in the user experience here. No, no problem. Uh, and now what we need is I have to specify what verb do I will use. I'm going to use get. And I need to make the request URL uh, pointed here. And then I just don't care about anything else. And I will get the response back. So I just made a request. And, an, and I got the response. And because the response is in JSON, uh, it has a kind of a pretty renderer. And it organizes the response um, such that it's you know nicer to work with and, and more readable. If I want to see what it looked like originally, I will see it the same as in the browser. Some browsers uh, do format JSON outputs uh, better than this one. Uh, but it's usually better to just use um, Postman because I can get additional things here. So for example, I see that I got a, a, a status code 200. Uh, and I also can see, um, I, I can save the response or I can you know, um, record the entire response. And I can also see all the headers. So the headers are the additional information that the server sent me together with the response. And the interesting for us is the content type. So the content type here is application JSON, which means I can deal with it as, as a JSON, um, JSON text. So let's do one more. Uh, I will go to my hello. Uh, so let's go to hello. No, it was rest hello, uh, rest hello. I will build. I will build this. So go build. And what it what it does, it it creates a, a very simple web server. We will look in, in a minute. Um, and I can run it. Um, so <clears throat> when I run it, my operating systems asks me, oh whoa, this this program wants to open a port. Do you want to allow it? Yes, I will allow it. And now I have a uh, on port 80, I have my service running. So I can go to a browser and I can go local host and ask, OK, what I'm going to get uh, here. And it says hello slash. And if I say hello local host um, Mariusz, then it says hello Mariusz. And if I say Mariusz, you know, number 200 and one it just prints whatever goes after the, the the initial slash right so it just grabs it grabs the whatever i have in my path uh after the local host and it just prints here so let's do the same with postman uh let's 
uh, what is post node here? So another plus, no, this one, this one. New request. Uh, hello, rest. Okay, and save to uni. And then I am gonna use localhost. So localhost, and I will say Marius. Okay, so let's execute this get and see what we're gonna get. And yeah, we're getting the same as the browser. Uh, if we check the headers, we see that the content type is text plain. It's not JSON, it's just a plain text. Uh, so for testing purposes, when you're developing your own, um, uh, your own services, you can use text plain initially such that you can sort of see in the browser what you want to see. And also if you have errors, they usually are transmitted as text, text plain and then the browser will render it for you. Um, so let's, let's have a look into uh, how, the, how the Hello REST service looks like. Uh, you will notice that I, to, to, to launch it, I have to pass an environmental variable called port. This is what is required in Heroku. So that's what uh, you will cover later. Um, if you want to test your Heroku stuff locally, you, you basically need to fake it. Um, and you can use other ports if you want. But then if you use other ports in your browser, you then have to say localhost colon the port that you picked, right? All right, so rest. So Go has quite a lot of facilities for dealing with web services and with sockets and with networking and, and so on, such that you can build pretty much everything using the uh, built-in facilities in the standard library. You don't need to have any external dependencies. So for our hello, hello rest, hello world type of thing in, the web, in a browser, uh, you, you notice that I'm only using OS because I have to get this port um, and all functionality that you really need is in the net, dot, um, net slash HTTP package. So that package offers a built-in web server uh, and it offers an ability for you to write callbacks and to write handlers of what should happen when you do the request. So if we start with the last line, uh, we see that this basically opens up a web server and starts listening for requests on a particular interface. I, I didn't specify an interface, which means I'm opening the connection on all my available interfaces on my laptop. And then, so colon plus port will effectively be, because I'm running it on port 80, will be like colon 80, means open up this web server on all available interfaces on port 80. And then I, uh, you, you usually don't deal with the, with the handler here. You have uh, certain abilities that, uh, and certain libraries will kind of inject themselves here. Uh, if you're doing a very simple things, you don't need the, uh, the second parameter. So you set it to nil. Uh, we log if something went wrong, if for example, port 80 was used and I cannot open the, the port 80, this will quit with an error. And then the error will stop my program because uh, the fatal is you know, stopping the, the program and logging a fatal message that something went terribly wrong and you can't proceed. You know, We cannot proceed if the server doesn't work. So if I have this server running and if I open the, another terminal and I kind of do the same again, it will say, whoa, whoa, it has this kind of a nice log um, error message. And it says address already in use because I have the server on port 80 already running here. So therefore the program quits and I cannot continue. So this is the last line. <laughs> and then the previous last line is you use the HTTP package to register all the handler functions which will deal with certain patterns in your URL. So what I did here is I'm registering a handler for the root of the URL. And if my request matches that pattern, which basically effectively means all requests will match the, you know, the initial slash, 
then I pass the handling of the of that request to that function. Uh, and that function is defined here and it takes two parameters. It takes the HTTP response and HTTP request. The response is where you write stuff into and the request is what you got. So from the request, you can, for example, extract the URL path as we are doing here. Uh, and then what we do is we push to the, to the response writer, to W, we push a formatted string which concatenates hello with the path of what has been passed into the, the request. So there is no, you know, um, no magic. Uh, you do need to browse the documentation to check what is available to you under um, the request struct. Uh, and then you can access those things. So path is one of those of those things. And then with the response writer, you treat it like a stream and you just dump stuff into it. So you can write into it binary data. You can write into it uh, text. You can write into it JSON. In our case, we writing to it plain text and the response is correct. Like we want the response code to be 200. So if I go to my, um, to my, so this hello Marius thing, you see that the response is 200. Uh, and you also see that the content type is text plain. Uh, and you know the content length is calculated by the by the runtime system, so you you usually don't feel that yourself. It's kind of done automatically for you. The date when the request was generated is done for you, and this one is done for you, but it's done for you only for text plane. If you want to send JSON back, you will have to change it to to JSON yourself. Um, otherwise, it will be text plane. We should not send JSON as text plane, although we can. Uh, and then the, the JSON text is basically rendered as text and then it's treated as text. So it will kind of work if you, you know, make your client and your server do both, both ends with text plane, but you should not do that uh, because it, it like, for example, in the case of the Chuck uh, joke, if the, if the body was set that it's not JSON, it's text plane, I wouldn't get this nice formatting here. Right, because the postman would think, oh yeah, it was just plain text, so there is nothing to format. Uh, whereas if it gets JSON, that it knows that it's uh, that's something to format. So you know, if I change the, I force it to to think it was a text. It says, okay, if it's text, that that's that's what you get, <laughs> because I don't deal with formatting text, um, you know, plain text uh, stuff. So even in pretty, I get this. But if I, you know. Uh, make it to what it is, then it, it, it looks kind of nicer. Having said that, if you get a response, so let's say, um, let's do this uh, quick hack. So if I, you know, uh, instead of s sending, um, so let's do a, a very quick hack here. And instead of sending uh, hello, this um, name, the, the, the path, uh, let's send a simple JSON. So I will do this, copy. Now actually, I can copy the whole thing. So uh, work, yeah. So let's write a very simple JSON. So we will do, we have a name, uh, which is Bob. And we have an age which is 10, yeah, that should do. I don't want to type too much and we don't need a parameter, right? And we have a nice string, but as you see in Go, Golang literals, I have to escape the, uh, the, the double quotes. So one way is to kind of escape all the double quotes, which are inside your string. Another way is to cheat and turn them into single quotes and JSON will deal with it quite fine as well. So if you're using single quotes inside JSON, JSON says, yeah, whatever, it's like JavaScript. I don't kind of care too much. So that would work as well. So let's, let's try that. So what I will kill the server. 
Um, we're not using this one. We're using this one. So I will kill it, rebuild it, and rerun it. And now we redo the request. Yes, I'm allowing this. So if I do it in the browser, um, it will, oh man, I, I have a missing, I am missing the closing. Yes, that's the one. All right, so one more time. Okay, so that should not change much in the browser. Again, if I uh, refresh it in the browser, it ju just renders as the as text. Uh, if I go to Postman and I do hello rest and I send the request, I get the response back. The header still says text plane. If I check the body response, it says, well, it's a text. So I render it like this, right? And it's a pretty printing of text, but I can kind of fake it. So I can say, look, treat it as JSON and then it will kind of render it nicely here, right? So as I said, if you're treating the, the JSON as text plane, it will kind of work, but you should not do that. You should always change the content type to say application JSON as we had uh, in, the, in the Chuck example. So here we have content type and we have application JSON and also we had additional information on what type of encoding that JSON text is in. And we basically told the client that it will be in UTF-8. Um, any questions so far? Right, so there was a question of the pattern matching on how the pattern matching works with the uh with this thing here right so if i do a pattern like this uh, and you should play with it because sometimes the behavior is non obvious so let's let's save it with a and let's re rebuild it and let's try so now i have uh, i'm allowing it i'm gonna run it in the browser it's a little bit faster then postman and we're just doing get request anyway so i'm doing slash and nothing else so i put slash nothing and it says well not found there there is no handler for handling just slash right so we get kicked out into the default handler and the default handler sa sends a 404 and and says page not found um i can actually check i can run this um uh, we can run it with Marius. We should get 404 as well. So I run it. I get 404 not found, and I can check what sort of response is that. So I see that the content um, content type is text plain, so no fanciness here, and the body is just this text with a new line character going into the next line. So that's all the default handler for not found is doing. All right, so let's change it. So if I now change it to A and resend it, I'm going to get 200 and I'm going to get my Bob. So we can see that the handler dealt, uh, where is that? Yeah, the handler now got matched. So my, uh, my original matching kind of worked and I got kicked to this method and this method handled my uh, slash A. So what, what if I do, so let's do this. Uh, I will copy that. So I will have hello handler and I will have Bob handler. So Bob is, Bob prints as Bob and this one prints as the path. Okay, so let's add another handler. So I have a hello handler And I will have Bob Handler. And we can say A slash Bob. And you know, we should get A handler dealing with um, just A and A slash Bob dealing with Bob. So let's see if that works. I will build it.
rerun it. Browser testing. All right, so the default local host not found, same story. Uh, we're not handling just the slash. Uh, if I say Bob, not found, that's good. Okay, what if I say just A? If I say just A, it says hello A. What if I say A slash? It says not found. Whoa, okay, uh, that's weird, right? And then if I say A slash Bob, well, we get our Bob. What if I say slash Bob slash? We, we get not found, all right? So you see, it is already quite important whether you finish your patterns with a trailing slash or not. If you don't finish it with trailing slash, the pattern matcher will treat it as a different route, which is not handled uh, for A and for Bob. If I want this behavior for A, but I don't want this behavior for Bob, because for example, I want to say I want Bob's name, right? I should be able to say that. So I want to deal with just asking for Bob and asking for Bob name. Um, if I ask for Bob, I get the whole Bob um, like this or like this, I get the whole record. If I ask like this, I just want his name. I don't want anything else, right? So I want to handle both of those cases, which means I have to put the trading slash. So then let's, let's test it. I mean, it will work, but just for consistency, we, we will test it, uh, run. All right, so then I have Bob without a slash, it works. Bob with the slash works as well. And you notice actually I got the slash automatically back because of my browser recognizing that it's kind of the same thing. Uh, that is kind of confusing also sometimes. So if you use Postman, the you know Postman will not do that for you. So whether you have the trailing slash or not is up to you. And now I, I cannot really have a request without the tra trailing slash because if I press enter, uh, the, you know the browser kind of fills in with the trailing slash. But if I say Bob's trailing slash name, it also works. So if I say A, it works if I say a slash something it doesn't. So what if I change it to a slash something? Well, then we will have a problem because this pattern will match a without the trailing slash, a with the trailing slash and a with trailing slash with something following it, which happened to be our second route, right? Our second route is a following Bob. And then I really want this to be handled by this callback, not by this callback. So let's try it. Uh, we now have a trading slash for the hello handler and Bob for, <laughs> for Bob. So let's kill this, let's build it and let's run it. All right, so I will go, I will go to Postman because I can control the slashes more you know, clearly. So again, if I just say A without a trailing slash, I get a handler. And you see that uh, I get a trailing slash, even if I made the request without a trailing slash, uh, if I say slash Marius, I get the handler handling Marius as we would like. But if I say Bob, I get Bob, which is good. So, and if I say Bob slash, it's working as we expect, right? Um, I did tested it yesterday uh, with the trailing slash, not with a slash. And I had a printout um, which was suggesting that both handlers were um, responding to, to something. Uh, it, in this way, like the way we have it now, it seems that the second one overtakes the first one and the first one is not running, but uh, I am not so confident that the behavior is, um, I mean, you need to play with it, right? So if it works, it works. If something is not right, you have to play with those trading slashes. That's the, the bottom line here. Um, any questions? Yeah, so with post, 
Uh, with post, we have to do a little bit more machinery, right? So I will close this project and I will open uh, another project, which I have this extra machinery to play with post and with a little bit more, um, I, I can basically play with get and post. So I will kill that. I will go to my REST student and I will open REST student. So REST student is a very simple crude um, setup where we can, uh, we basically have a type, which is a student. Um, and then we have an in-memory database, which stores our students. And I basically store them as a map between the ID student ID and the, the instance, such that I can uh, initialize the database. I can find the a particular student and I, I'm searching for students using the map, the, uh, map, which as I said, maps a student ID with the instance, such that I can uh, do a very quick search. And then I can uh, count how many students I have. I can get a particular student by the key ID and I can get all the students out of my database, right? So I have a struct uh, which I which represents my database, but it, it fakes it. It basically stores everything in memory. I'm, I'm not doing really any database calls. And this is a, a nice way of mocking your API because usually what will happen is you will have some sort of um, type which represents your database access. It could be an interface or it could be like a, a struct like we have it here. Um, and that type makes kind of a real calls to your database. But if you want to test it or if you want to start without doing this kind of a persistence, you can do it with the in-memory setup. One extra note uh, about, so one extra note about the uh, the way you do composition in your in your types. So a student is a, a single struct that has name and age. But as we discussed yesterday, you can have a type which says a person is a struct which has a name. Person has a name and age. All all people do. Then uh, what? Should, should I repeat like, you know, how, how to deal with it? And we said, well, then you, you basically say, uh, no, no, um, uh, you basically say that there is a P which is a person and then you have, uh, you don't need those two. And then you have uh, a student ID, which is the, um, something that differentiates a, a person, a, like a generic person from a student, right? Uh, there is a, a syntactic sugar uh, in, in Golang uh, such that you don't need this P. Uh, I, I, can, I mean, you can have it, you can, and, and then like, if you do have this P, if, you, if I have the instance, so if S is, so let's call S is a student. So I have a generic student here, and then I would say stud.p.name to get the person name of that student, right? Um, there is a syntactic sugar and you can skip the P. So you can say, I don't want P. And then Golang will generate the, the type that you have here as the name for that field that you have. So it will actually call it person and then you call it like this, right? So, and then you see the inheritance. Uh, it's not an inher inheritance, it's a composition, but you see that a student is composed of a person and the person has a name, right? So, um, so that's kind of a syntactic sugar here to do this notation. So instead of introducing kind of a, a, a different name, you can kind of make it idiomatic and then use person as, as your, um, as your field. There is kind of funny thing though. Uh, so if you go to tour, uh, I, I didn't notice that before, but in Golang tour, if you go here, uh, they, yeah, I have to go, um, where is it? 
Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I don't want to spend time searching for it, but they, they basically had this example and they kind of showed it like this with the person. It's probably in the, in the part about structs. Um, but Go actually has another syntactic nice, um, nice thing, which means you can call it without that person here at all, right? So you can actually call it like this. And it will pretend that name is a, a field of stud. Right, so if you did this like this without naming the field yourself, then you can call it like this with name being kind of accessible directly on the student. Um, so this is a, a kind of a nice way of flattening your structs such that then the student sort of has name and age as if it had, but it's just a syntactic sugar. You know, you really have a field there and that field is has a certain uh, property. And then when you're dealing with JSON, it can kind of uh, bite your ass a little bit. So for the sake of this example, we kind of flatten it and we pretend that we don't have any type inheritance and that the students have name um, and age directly, uh, which makes sense. Like if you don't need this hierarchy, if you don't need this composition, if I'm not using the concept of a person anywhere in my domain, why should I introduce it? I, I, I just don't need it, right? Um, so then I have a flat hierarchy and, I, and you notice that I have a certain annotations for JSON uh, because the, the struct has the name, age and student ID capitalized. And that would be literally what uh, JSON would take for naming the fields of the struct. So it would expect that I have a struct with a kind of a capital name name capital A H and, and this as fields. So then if I want to do something else, I have to tell um, runtime system, if this is represented as JSON, I want this field to be name name, this field to be name H, and this field to be name student ID with all lowercase and with without any um, underscores or dashes or anything like the way I want it, right? So if Usually when we prepare structs to be uh, managed by JSON, we sort of do these annotations and you will, you will uh, see the same. If I go back to hello jokes, no, uh, hello jokes doesn't do that. It's the, uh, the library which does it. So if I go to hello jokes, you will see that the joke struct also has uh, certain capitalized categories uh, but then for the names of the fields, I use a different notation, which matches what the, what the API uses, right? So uh, if you go to that joke thing again, you will notice that categories is called categories with small c, and then uh, URL is called URL with small u, and then uh, icon URL is called icon with small i underscore underscore URL. If you do that, you have two problems. One problem is that your names are not visible outside your package because they are lowercase, right? So in your package, if I had, uh, where is this here? If I had this uh, lowercase, um, then I cannot export it outside of my package and other packages wouldn't use the fields of that struct. I have to have it capitalized. So that's one problem between uh, lowercase naming and, and upper. The other problem is uh, variable uh, notation in Golang uses camel case, not snake case. And this is kind of a snake case. And then your linters and everything and everybody will be a bit upset saying, oh, you don't follow idiomatic camel case in Golang. You're using snake, so use camel case, right? That's why in our fields, we sort of use um, camel case, uh, which I'm kind of violating here because D should be sort of lower, but sometimes it allows it. I've, those are kind of acronyms. But if I had underscore, uh, if I had underscore here, um, let's do that. Then I would have um, a warning saying use camel case, you know, student ID, you should change it to student ID like this, right? So your ID and um, yeah, you get the idea. So we need, you, you need to do this mapping. 
Any questions about the structs and, and JSON? Yeah, so if the, uh, there was a question, what happens if, you, if you're doing this um, embed, uh, embedding and you have uh, multiple fields? So if I, if I do this with a person and person also had the name, then what happens? Well, nothing happens. Uh, your stud, right? It's just syntax, syntactic sugar. So your stud student. Uh, so imagine that I have a person here which declares a name, which is a string. And then I have my stud. Uh, then if you want this name from the student, you would say stud, stud name. And if you want the, the name from the person, you would say stud person name. The, that record, that struct will have two fields now called name, one from a person, one from a student. And you access them like this, right? Can you do a different formatting here? Can you use different annotations for formatting the struct, for example, for HTML and so on? Yes, you can. So it depends on the library that you're using or the facilities that the encoder will use and how they use those annotations. And then you can use it for other things. But uh, I haven't played with anything apart JSON. So I don't know uh, how it works and which libraries would support it. Natively, I don't think it is supported um, in the um, in the encoding package, but I don't know. So uh, that's a good question. Uh, any other questions? Right. So the. One more important thing that I, I need to uh, do here is the way which we handle those, the, the responses. So as you see, this response is organized into a struct. And then if you go to the, to the API, uh, you will find that uh, when we, so uh, for example, here, uh, I have the abil ability to do post. And when I do post, I'm kind of expecting that JSON to come in a body. Uh, and then from the re request, I extract the body of, of what came in here and I'm doing a decoding. And the way I'm doing the decoding is I create an empty uninitialized um, placeholder for the student and I pass it here to obtain the exactly the fields that we have declared in here, right? So what the parser will do, it will try to match what the body, what the um, fields of my struct of my JSON text are to match them with the struct fields and then fill in the student struct. So at this point here, at this line, so here I will have a representation of my JSON as a student record. So what happens if I send um, and, and as I, uh, so it will kind of expect, it will expect kind of a string in a form of name uh, Bob, right? Comma, if I don't have H, what will happen? Well, H will be not initialized. It will, whatever is the default value, right? So dealing with missing fields is robust enough that this decoder will just fill in the fields that it knows about and skip the ones that are missing here. What if I have a field which says um, um, sex, right? So I have maybe male and then I don't know about sex. My record doesn't have any sex here. So what will happen then? Well, it will be ignored, right? And I will not know that I got something with sex in it, which is kind of a shame, right? Uh, maybe. So if you have these situations that sometimes you get something more that you, your, your uh, struct deals with, or if those things are, are dynamic, or if those things is a kind of a long list of stuff, and you don't want to be creating this sort of a long list of fields in your 
in your nicely organized struct for parsing, then the, uh, sorry, then there is a kind of a neat trick you can do. So instead of forcing it to be a student, what you can do alternatively, you can say, okay, I, I'm, I'm kind of really interested what sex Bob is. And I know sometimes when I get this post request, I get his sex, right? So what you can do is um, instead of doing it kind of a, in a strictly typed fashion, you can do this. You can declare, you can declare a variable S, which is a map of string, right? Uh, because everything here is a string. And then what is here? Ah, uh, we have to answer that question, right? So if everything here is a string, then you could say string to string, right? And then the parser will be able to force this record into something like this. And then, you know, somewhere here, you can say, okay, I want to get the sex of Bob. And then you, you kind of access that particular property and you will get mail, right? Because it's a string to string. But what if it's mixture? What if it is, you know, the stupid H as well? And it's 10 and this is a number, it's not a string, right? In some APIs, you will realize they do this. They actually send you uh, numbers as strings, right? And then voila, you can kind of map string to string because everything is a string, but we doing it properly. We actually sending H as a number and that screws that up. So then what should we put here? Well, we need something generic. We, we need something that represents both strings as, as you see here and numbers as you see here because we have strings and numbers. Then, well, Golang is not super fancy. Um, there is type called interface, interface curly brace, interface, right? And this, if you did Java programming, this is an equivalent of saying it's an object. Uh, we don't know what it is, it's something. Uh, and it's the same in Golang. If you don't know what you're gonna get, you just use interface curly braces and then anything will, will fit. In fact, if you have, you know, if you have a brother and then you have an instance of uh, another object in here, right? So if I have a brother, which is uh, again name and it's, um, Charlie, of course, then it will work as well. And then under brother, if I say get brother, I will get, what will I get? Um, well, it's kind of uh, problematic. What I think I should get is a map of string to string, right? I am likely to get a map of string to string because that's what um, Golang will probably guess that is a type of this to substitute with this, but you don't know. You basically will have to test, right? So you will have to do some sort of a type um, type check uh, to see, okay, what in, in what type you got the data back. But that allows you to deal with kind of a dynamic parsing of JSON in such a way that uh, allows a flexibility of what you're getting here. And you can be guaranteed that you're gonna get all the fields, right? So we had this example um, uh, with uh, currency conversions. So for example, I have a currency like, you know, New Zealand dollar, Norwegian krona, Euro, whatever, right? And I have some kind of values here for the conversions, but this list is quite long and this list like you ask it today and it, let's say the API gives you 20 currencies. But if you ask it tomorrow, maybe it gives you 22 currencies because they've added support for two new currencies, right? If you created a struct with 20 currencies, you will not see the new two extra currencies that they've designed. So in that case, it's, uh, yeah, exactly. So thanks, Thomas. Thomas on the uh, chat uh, posted like uh, how, how it looks like. Then, you know, generating this structured struct for dealing with currencies, yeah, first of all, it's pain in the ass. And second of all, you will not deal with the new currencies, right? So it's better to do this trick with the, with the map. And if you know exactly what is on the right-hand side, you can actually make it relatively type safe by putting this type, you know, uh, the ints or floats or string, whatever that is, right? The problem is if that doesn't match the, the the decoder will blow up, right? Uh, so it has to somehow match. 
the advantage of doing it the first type, the first way with the very structured uh, structs is that you have type safety. You have no uh, things kind of um, being changed under your feet. So the types are very strict and the parsing is very strict. And if the message doesn't fit that the, the, the type, then you're gonna get error. So for example, if you, uh, if you got, um, if you got uh, H as a, as a string, uh, you're very likely to have the, the decoder complaining. Like, you know, H, you, you told me H is gonna be an, a number, but it isn't, right? Then something is wrong. So that gives you type safety. So in situations where you need type safety, following a formal struct model is better. In situations where you don't need type safety, uh, following the kind of the map model is better. So it's a little bit up to you. All right, so I reached the end of the time that we had today. Uh, I have already committed the, the code to the repositories such that you can uh, check it out and um, read, the, uh, read the examples and see how you can manage post and put. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to clarify a little bit the, some of the messiness that is in the chat and also that is in the hello and how you can fix it using some additional libraries. Uh, but as I pointed out, I do recommend you reading the, uh, reading the blog post about how to do the routing. For simple things, the default routing uh, that you have in net HTTP is sufficient. And it, as you will read from the blog post, it's, it's really fast also. Uh, but for a little bit more robust way of dealing with parameters and so on, maybe you can use a library. Uh, if you're doing it um, using the built-in HTTP, you have to do pattern matching and you have to do extraction of parameters yourself, such that, for example, if you if you want to do something in the API, like, um, so if you want to say, I want students with a particular ID, then you have to extract this parameter, the last parameter, because you want to search what ID you want to search for. Um, then this extraction you have to do yourself. If you're using a library, that will be kind of extracted for you, right? Uh, so there are, some, there are some facilities and some help that the libraries can, can do. All right, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. If you have questions or issues, please post them onto the issue tracker. Uh, and then tomorrow the, the session is optional for everybody with the exception of PROC 206 students for whom that session is not optional. I mean, all sessions are optional, but you know, uh, it's more optional <laughs> than, than normal. And then we're gonna discuss a little bit more of how code can be improved and how I don't like certain things that are in the examples. Um, so we will spend a little bit more time on how uh, you can improve your coding and your um, readability by using a little bit uh, more elaborate structures. Yeah, so uh, there is a question in the, in the Zoom about slash a variable, uh, something like what I did here. Uh, and th this is available, uh, usually they, they use like uh, curly braces for variables because the less than, more than are actually symbols. Uh, so uh, in libraries, you can use it and you can extract those variables later. Uh, using the default handler, you don't have this, those facilities. You will have to sort of um, extract the, the, the path because all you get if you, if you go uh, let me go to code. Yeah, where is this? Uh, that's not the good one. Yeah, anyway, like remember when, when we had um, from the request, you get the URL and you get the path. Um, then you effectively just gonna get the string and you need to extract those elements from the path that the request gave you yourself. It's not a big deal. I, you can use string split and you can use uh, fields and you can kind of get it based on, uh, on some pattern matching, but you have to do it manually. If you're using a library, then the library kind of will allow you to specify paths with a little bit of a pattern and it will parse it for you, right? So it, it's a little bit nicer. 
Ja. Okay, so I will stop recording.